Welcome. My name is Michael McDonnell. I am the cybersecurity librarian. This is my co-host, Moro Arakaki. How are you, Hello, Moro? Everyone. Pretty good. Yourself, Michael? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm 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 excited for tonight's live stream. Uh, so am I. The, the guest we have is a, a serious heavy hitter, especially for a student population out there. So I'm super excited about this live stream. Uh, so for our audience, thank you for joining us. Um, this is another live stream in our series on careers in cybersecurity, and it's another one in our series for students. Um, uh, let me explain the background why we're doing this specific one before I even tell you about the guests. So last month, um, I was a cybersecurity awareness month guest speaker at Mount Royal University, and there was another guest speaker. Uh, Angela McAllister from the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. She did a great talk on um, the career preparedness for students. So what skills do our graduates need to enter into the cyber workforce? Um, except the only people who could attend that were Mount Royal University people. And so all of the good students we work with at the University of Calgary and St. Nate, oh, so I invited her to come on our live stream to do a repeat presentation. Uh, and we'll take some questions and answers as we always do. Um, before I introduce the, uh, the our guests, Moro, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, other than, you know, uh, obviously, uh, if, if you like our channel, please uh, subscribe. If you like this video, hit the like button, help everyone else find the video. We definitely appreciate it. Hit the reminder button if you always want to uh, stay tuned with uh, what we're doing here uh, on a semi-weekly basis. So, I'm I'm really digging the uh, sepia tone vibe you've got next to my blue <laughs> Twitch streamer style background. This is sort of uh, that's all lighting. Man. Is this that's is this red stuff. team blue team that we've got? I don't know. It's... I'm not really red. Yeah, team. It's, I don't yeah. know team, if if that if there's such thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so let me introduce our guest, Angela McAllister. How you doing, Angela? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. And we've got your uh, coworker, uh, yeah. Jen. Jen's having a few technical problems tonight. <laughs> uh, we should be able to hear her fine. Jen, can you hear us? I can definitely hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, crystal clear. Excellent. Thanks That's so much fantastic. for having me. And we also have... Uh, Jeremy Stewart from the University of Alberta Information Security Club. Um, say hi, Jeremy. Hi, everyone, and good evening. And cl close, Mike, I'm going to have to correct you. It's the University of Calgary Information Security. What, what did I say? University of Alberta. <laughs> now, those are two different institutions. <laughs> and I don't know if it's all know, good. This is just another thing for a blooper reel. It's all there's good. There's a animosity <laughs> between those two. <laughs> I graduated from the first one, not the second one. <laughs> I am a current student of the second one. So uh, there you go. There you go. I, 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 I don't play favorites. Um, <laughs> um, I see what you tried to do there, though. Yeah. <laughs> so almost got me. If there are, hey, uh, in the audience, are there any University of Alberta students? Uh, if you're a student, Shout out to your institution. Who's from Nate? Who's from Sate? Who's from Bow Valley College? Um, we'd love to to know. So please type that in the chat and let us know. Um, so uh, uh, the agenda tonight, folks, is um, Angela's going to give a presentation. Um, and uh, then we're going to take questions and answers. We've done a survey and we've got some results. And so um, I think what we'll do in the question and answers. Uh, we'll give Jeremy a chance to represent the students, and then we've got the questions from the survey to go on, uh, and we'll do our very, very best to answer everything. Um, uh, but um, 
Uh, Angela, do you want to do you want to start your presentation? Sure, absolutely. Um, okay. Do you need to do anything, or you're good? No, we're 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 good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I received my first post-secondary education from Algonquin College in 1998 as an electronics engineering technologist. Um, I graduated right into the high-tech boom and I immediately found work. Several years later, I became a certified engineering technologist through OSET. And sometime after that, I went back to school, got my Bachelor of Science in Technology, and now I'm completing a Master of Technology Management at Memorial University. I've worked in the field of cybersecurity for about 15 years, and I've had different roles like ComSec technologist, technical writer, supply chain analyst, and now I'm the supervisor of the academic outreach and engagement team at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. As well, so you know, I'm also a part-time professor at Algonquin College. Um, Today, my first topic of dis discussion is going to be on the th cyber threat landscape that we're facing, the one that we're currently seeing a shortage of skills in. Then I'm going to talk about cybersecurity and the new economy, and then I'll give you a little bit of information about careers in cybersecurity, what they look like, and some information about the Cyber Center and working there. So, my last semester at Algonquin, in 1998, that's when I got my first email account and I didn't use it. I thought the whole living on the internet thing was for geeks. Oh my goodness, how naive I was. The future of cybersecurity and digital privacy was already well underway and I had absolutely no idea. It wasn't long though, before I was looking for a house online, sending emails online, um, <coughs> excuse me, downloading music, totally legally and applying for jobs, doing that all online. And now it seems that every day that goes by, the world is becoming increasingly digital, automated, and connected. The truth of the matter is that we live online. We do our banking, we share our photos, we work from home now. We can even control our thermostat or we can lock our car doors right from our bed. But with this new way of life, and it is new, 20 years of development and doing things a certain way is still new. Because if you think about it, we lived on paper for hundreds of years. So with this new way of life, we need new ways to protect ourselves because protecting our online identities can protect our reputation and the reputation of our workplace. And we are just really, as a society, starting to understand the dangers that lurk. Fake news, for instance, who heard about that 10 years ago? But now, with its danger to the election process, it's a topic of concern. And the scary part, to me, and about living online, living and sharing our lives online, is that the youth growing up today, and I see it in my daughter and her friends, they want everyone to know everything about them, where they go, who they see, what they eat. But what they don't realize is that they still need to protect certain parts of their identity, as well as those devices on which they're having so much fun from malicious actors. And the same goes for businesses, governments, and academia. All the places our graduates and our youth will eventually work. Businesses have Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook accounts. They make announcements online about their latest projects. They post bios of their executives. They put so much information out there to stand out and be recognized without realizing that that same information can be used against them. All of us need to adapt ourselves to this changing reality and be prepared to continue to adapt into this foreseeable future. So what exactly is cybersecurity? Well, technically, it's the methods we use to protect our data and the systems and networks on which that data lives, is stored, transmits, and is processed. And we need to protect our data, not only because it belongs to us, but also because our data gives us an advantage over our competitors. It helps us get jobs, secure sales, 
have the upper hand in negotiations. So cybersecurity is really the backbone on which we as individuals, businesses and nations build our success. What, is, what it really is, is it's the constant pursuit to secure our information systems, the data on them and the services that they provide. It's about protecting the systems that all Canadians rely on like healthcare, banking, telecom, energy and transportation. It's about protecting individuals and businesses, big or small. Cybersecurity really is about securing our future. And Canadians and Canadian organizations are connecting more of what they value most to the internet. Malicious threat, cyber threat actors take advantage of low cybersecurity awareness and new technological developments as they try to gain access to our digital information. And they're looking for information on Canadian individuals, businesses, and critical infrastructure. Information like your finance, your banking information, or information like intellectual property, think COVID-19 vaccine, or personal information that they can just use to create their own identities. Some systems that cyber threat actors target are used to maintain essential services, ones that we all rely on, like transportation, water, health services, and communications. And in the workplace, every employee, no matter their role, must be cyber aware and use cy good cyber hygiene. But why are we under threat? I mean, we're nice people, right? We say sorry a lot. We have great whiskey, good beer, bonfires, beautiful fall colors. Like, what gives? Well, we're under threat because we have resources and lots of them. We have agriculture, water, oil, wood. We have access to the Arctic. We have money, we are a rich country, and we have a high standard of living and a stable banking system, and we are online. We have over 32 million internet users in a country of like, what, 36 million? That's a lot. And now, with the realities of COVID, we work and hang out with friends online, and we do even more things online. <clears throat> We also have a lot of great businesses and a lot of international businesses have their offices here. We're smart and we have smart, rich friends. Threat actors can target us in order to get access to our friends' information. Now extend that to our international friends because we are international players. We're members of NATO, the World Health Organization and many other national in committees and boards. So they can, um, threat actors can target Canadian businesses, Canadian governments, or Canadian individuals to get access to other information from our friends and our international friends. Now, there's good news. The good news is that in Canada, we have the cyber knowledge to keep our information secure. In fact, you probably have it here in your own institution. But the bad news is, is that we have a large deficit of workers with the knowledge required to protect our information and systems. In fact, 82% of employers have reported a shortage and 71% believe that this shortage has caused measurable damage. And when they made this presentation about six months ago, there is about 5,000 positions right now that need to be filled by cybersecurity professionals. But it doesn't matter really what the numbers are or what the stats are. What matters is the demand for cybersecurity professionals is acute, it's immediate, and it's growing. And we as a country need to remove those adjectives. But we also don't just need programmers or um, computer science specialty specialists. Surprisingly, the responsibility of protecting those networks does not rest solely on the shoulders of the highly technical staff who design, operate, and maintain the networks. Every employee has a role to play. Employees need to behave in a safe and secure manner. To do so, they must be trained. Therefore, learning and teaching professionals are required to develop and deliver courses. But it goes much further than that. What does safe and secure really mean? 
Perhaps a policy analyst or a communications expert can help define the needs of the organization. And organizations must also ensure that they are compliant with the growing list of laws and standards. This points to a need for lawyers and policymakers who understand the implications of cybersecurity on day-to-day -day operations. Now to hire people with the appropriate skills, human resource professionals must know what certifications and experience to look for. Similarly, effectively enforcing cybersecurity policies requires coordination between groups within an organization. This, re may, this requires the ability to work with diverse groups to define technical measures that have the right balance between security and usability. We need professionals that understand risk and can take the risk appetites of an organization into consideration. To remain cyber secure, businesses need staff that have knowledge that goes beyond that of just computers. Because cybersecurity, it really is a team sport and an interdisciplinary field. And the reality of today is that we have a shortage in all aspects of cybersecurity. So now I have a question for you guys. So maybe you can we can use the chat and I'll look at the comments because I can see the comments too. And I'm gonna ask you, what is it that I'm describing? And then you can just type in your answer. So, it cannot be known. It will be different from what exists now. And it's only certainties are death and taxes. What am I talking about? Anybody? Anybody have a comment? Well, if you said the future, you are correct. And we cannot predict the future, but what can we do? Now, if you know, if you've read any of uh, management books and you know about Peter Drucker's concept, he has this concept called the future that has already happened. And he says that while we cannot predict the future, we can try to anticipate the future effects of events that have already happened. Well, I think I was supposed to, there we go, yeah. So do you remember when I bored you with the details of getting my first email account in 1998? And I said that the future of privacy and cybersecurity was well underway. At that time, we were already storing personal information on our computers. In fact, we could do our tax returns sh online shortly after that. Businesses were relying on computer networks to, to accomplish their business goals. Email was king. Those changes in technology and how we used it were, was paving the way to phishing emails, ransomware, and viruses, and so on. They were paving the way towards the need for cybersecurity professionals. And I wish I could say that I was smart enough back then to know, to know that and to get into the field, but that would be a lie. In 1998, I, as a graduate, had no idea how the work environment, my work environment, would change over the next decade or so. So what does that mean in terms of cybersecurity and success for our graduates in this new economy? Well, no one answer can be given, not for certain anyway. We need to look to our economists, our technologists, our scientists and engineers, our business professionals and our social scientists. We need to look to academia, industry and government and all work together and discuss recent breakthroughs or happenings in the technology field and try to predict the impact they will have on the skills the labor force, you, our future, our future graduates, will need to be successful in this new economy. And we can gather and analyze data. We can study past trends. We can look for disruptions. We can make predictions because that is really all we can do is anticipate the future effects of events that have already happened. I'll get into some of those events in a couple slides. So, but first, what is this new economy that I'm talking about and what will it look like? Well, I can't answer that question without a crystal ball, and I don't have one. But a 2018 report by RBC called Humans Wanted, How Canadians Can Thrive in the Age of Disruption, it lists 10 key findings. And 
two of them, two of which I'd like to discuss today. The first prediction says that 25% of current jobs, and I want to point out that it says current jobs, so not just IT jobs, all jobs, so 25% of all jobs will be heavily disrupted over the next decade, meaning they're going to change completely over the next decade. And fully half of them will go through a significant overhaul. But if we have learned anything from my boring stories, it's that most, if not all, will feel the effects of this future that has already happened. Now, the eighth key finding is that digital fluency will be an essential skill for workers, our graduates, right? So what does digital fluency mean and what is this future that has already happened? Well, let's take a step back for a second and let's think about the first industrial revolution, right? So that used water and steam power to mechanize production. And the second revolution used electric power to create mass production. And the third used electronics and IT to automate production. And there's a pattern there if you look for it. And it is that each industrial revolution was building on the next and making more technology accessible for businesses and for people. And so now a fourth industrial revolution is on the rise and it's building on the third. It's the digital revolution and it has been occurring since the middle of the last century. And this digital revolution it's a combination of technologies that are blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological scopes. Have you ever seen social media posts that tell you what the color of your eyes mean? Click here and learn what, your, what the color of your eyes mean, right? Do you think, that just for a second, that that could be a post made up by a malicious actor who is gathering biometric data to be used when that technology is commercially available. It could be. So we don't know yet, we do not yet know just how this future will unfold, but one thing is clear. We are entering a cyber physical world where the number of corporations is declining and person to person commerce is increasing. We're part of this gig economy a labor market of short-term contracts or freelance work as opposed to permanent jobs. And current technologies are enabling this transformation. Old systems are crumbling, they really are, and the new ones are just beginning to um, form. But more importantly, it's, being, it's disrupting almost every industry in the country. And the breadth and the depth of these changes are transforming entire systems of production, systems of management and governance. It's transforming the ways that we learn, the ways that we work and the ways that we socialize. And as well, new laws are being written and new crimes are being committed. Crimes that couldn't have been committed 25 years ago are being committed now. So maybe it's time Maybe we need to call on our philosophers, our psychologists, our social scientists, and ask them to think about these issues. What impacts will their new technologies have on the individual, on society, or on business? And how will this change in the structure of society impact us all? So on this slide, there's a lot of words. More that's recommended, um, but I did it on purpose because this might be the most important slide of my talk. Um, it's a quote from the 2016 Economic Forum article entitled The Fourth Revolution, What It Means and How to Respond. So I want to read it together. The possibilities of billions of people connected by mobile devices then those devices have unprecedented processing power, storage capacity, and they give access to a limited amount of knowledge. So it makes the possibilities unlimited. And we can all agree 
to the fact that modern computing power has provided a zillion, and I'm not even exaggerating, a zillion new opportunities and possibilities. So I want to take you back to 1998 again. My final semester, final project, presentation day. My team, we built an amplifier and an equalizer for a stereo system. But another student presented a really great innovative idea, and he called it the wearable computer. We thought he was crazy. All of us, everybody, we just were like laughing inside. We thought, sure, we can take a computer wherever we want to go. Why would we want to do that? Now, our phones are computers. We have them in our pocket. We're literally wearing our computers. Hindsight being 2020, so it actually wasn't such a crazy idea. Looking back, I wish I was smarter. I could go back and smack myself across the face and say, be smarter, Angela. But so let's move on. And all these possibilities will be multiplied by emerging technology breakthroughs in fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, material science, energy storage, and quantum computing. Okay, that's awesome. But what I want you to think about is that this article was written just in 2016, so four short years ago, and we are already seeing these products in the marketplace. Home monitoring solutions are here, 3D printing is here, autonomous vehicles are on their way as well. So I have another question for you. Do you think delivery truck drivers will be required once autonomous vehicles are commercially available? Will delivery trucks even be necessary if we have drones? So when I tell you that our, uh, the workforce is going to change and a full 25% of jobs are going to have an overhaul, a 50% significant overhaul, I'm not talking about just the IT jobs. I'm talking about every industry across Canada. Now think about quantum computing. Quantum computing, computers, they're coming, they're on our way. They're about 20 to 30 years away. And our current encryption methods need revising because they won't stand up to quantum computing speeds. So we need to think about how these new technological breakthroughs, once in production, will impact the skills required by our jobs, required by our jobs, and we need to be prepared. And we also need to ensure that the technical people that design these great products design in security from the beginning. Really, like if you think about it, do we want someone taking over the Amazon drone and redirecting our package to them? That's a possibility in the way we're going. Oh, my, oh, my slide didn't change. Let's go back. Oopsie. Okay, there we go. So the point of that last slide and probably the most important slide is that the world is changing very fast and we need to keep up. COVID has shown the world that, I mean, sorry. For example, COVID has shown the world that many jobs can be done successfully from home. This wasn't a priority for many businesses a few years ago, but now that they're seeing the benefits of a remote workforce, it's becoming a lot more popular. But my question to them is, have they updated their security policies to reflect this new operational reality? Because we're creatures of habits. We, even though we are creatures of habits, we need to take the unknown into account because our ever-changing world has made us realize that we need to draw inferences and make unexpected connections to identify disruptions and trends. And we need to perceive data as our greatest asset and not only find technical ways to protect it, but develop that understanding in all of our graduates, no matter their program. Digital innovation is here to stay and it will change the business models of many organizations, if not all. My mobility is the new norm. So is bring your own device. So, I mean, if I can work from home, why does it really matter where my home is located? And if I wanted to go 
and uh, do my work from Bermuda or well, Barbados in January and February and March because you know Canadian winters are great so I'd want to get out of them but just say I did I wanted to go to Bar Barbados do my work there for three months why does it really matter does it matter that our data is crossing international lines? Does it matter that our data is not only maybe transiting through the US, but then being stored in servers um, in Barbados? It does, it really does. You have to think, what are the laws in place in Barbados in the US? Are, is our data our own once it goes across out of our borders? So the bottom line is, we need more cybersecurity professionals in all aspects of cybersecurity. This happened to me the last time with my slides. All right. <clears throat> so, what do cybersecurity professionals do? Um, did you know that despite its small market size, Canada was the third most targeted country to cyber attacks in 2018? It's true. The growing threat of cyber attacks has made governments and industries more aware of the need to protect and defend the information and the systems that Canadians rely on. And as a result, cybersecurity is growing into a recognizable discipline that encompasses multiple specialties in science, math, business, social science, and, and computing and engineering faculties. And although only a subset of businesses participate directly by producing or selling cybersecurity solutions or by building or operating networks, every business uses technology to deliver its products and service securely and efficiently to consumers. Cybersecurity, as a result, has become more important to the protection of a computer systems of all businesses and in all industries. So you can see on this slide that cyber uh, security professionals, they work in all fields, they protect our nation, they work to in DND and CSIS and RCMP um, and CSC, they work for our telecommunications companies to protect that infrastructure, they work for banks and financial institutions, they work in our energy systems, they protect our identities, they ensure our medical information remains private, and they work to stop ransomware attacks. So cybersecurity professionals can work in any, any industry. All right, so my slide does not want to work again. So we're just going to have to trick it. Bam, bam, there we go. So cybersecurity professionals, what are they? Well, one, they're in demand. Why? Because businesses of all kinds have proprietary information that they need to protect. They also have the personal information of their employees, their clients, suppliers, and business partners to protect. Every on online realtor, bank, school, law firm, medical facility, utility, government has information and systems that need protection. Companies that engineer systems or new technologies or companies that perform design work, they have intellectual property that needs to be protected. Basically, if a business uses the internet or a network to perform its tasks, it needs cybersecurity professionals because cybersecurity is fundamental to good business. <laughs> Again. There we go. So how do you get into the cybersecurity field? Well, one of the first things that you can do is to network. Get on LinkedIn, get yourself a profile, make it a good profile. LinkedIn has a lot of resources to help you build a nice profile. And get on, so get on there, start connecting with people in the industry. Businesses post their jobs there and recruiters use it as a tool to find candidates. I've started a network, a group called the Aspiring Cybersecurity Professionals Group. Connect with me and join that group and maybe you can uh, find somebody in there that can help you. Um, another thing you can do is focus on understanding the basics of IT, such as administering and configuring systems and networks, such as how telecommunications work, what is database management, and understanding how to do some coding 
will go a long way towards getting your first job. But you have to focus your interests because it's impossible to be an expert in all categories. Focus in on an area like, for instance, networking security and understand it very well. Think ahead maybe five to 10 years. What is your dream job? And then look for an entry level position that'll give you the right skills. You can also gain practical experience through co-op positions or internships that'll help you get a sense of the IT procedures and real world business operations. Even if you're not in a program that offers those types of positions, you can accomplish a lot with self-directed learning. And there is this new great tool by Tech Nation that helps you um, find jobs all across Canada and talks about the different roles and the different jobs and the different responsibilities and knowledge required by those jobs. And it's called the Career Finder. Oh my goodness, we'll get there. Nope, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so what can you do? How Now, here are some um, educational pathways to help you. So you can, you guys are already either in a college or um, a university program, um, but you can go and get a master's degree or a graduate certificate. That'll definitely go a long way with helping you or you can obtain a certification um, and you can do some self-studying to get you the knowledge and maybe a little bit of experience to put on your resume. Um, now we've published the Cyber Center, a cybersecurity career guide, and it talks about the different roles that cybersecurity professionals can have and how they can, um, <coughs> excuse me, and how they can get into the field a little easier. Um, it has a listing of valuable certifications that, uh, sorry, of certifications that employers value, as well as a listing of the different college and university programs in cybersecurity that are offered all across Canada. So take a look at the student guide as well. If you're curious about what kind of role you want, you can go to the Cyber Center's website and look for our Workforce Development and Curriculum Guide. And that give, will give you an, an overall high-level view of the cybersecurity ecosystem and the different types of jobs that are available in Canada. And it breaks those jobs down into four categories. And there's, I think, 35 jobs listed between the four categories. And you can go in to each of the sections and see what jobs are underneath protecting and defending or designing and developing, governing and supporting, and then take a look at the responsibilities and the knowledge and skills that are required to be able to do those jobs. And that's all listed in this document. Now, so who is the Cyber Center? Well, we're new, so we're only a couple years old, but we're the primary federal government point of contact on cybersecurity operational matters for the government of Canada and external partners. Um, we monitor the cybersecurity environment in Canada, and we use that understanding to identify, address, and share our knowledge about systemic threats, risks, and vulnerabilities. And we actively collaborate with researchers, industry, and academia on cybersecurity problems. We work on some really cool problems. So, and we are Canada's authority on cybersecurity. So when you think about, you know, for the weather, you would go to Environment Canada. For cybersecurity matters, you would come to the Cyber Centre. Now, I'm going to give you a little overview on what we do. Um, a tremendous amount of the what we do is defend the networks and information of the federal government. But keep in mind that every Canadian citizen, every Canadian company, every provincial and territorial government, and many municipal ones, and every foreign government and company that does business in Canada connects directly with the government of Canada. We also inform Canadians 
or Canada and Canadians about cybersecurity matters, including cybersecurity threats, through our Get Cyber Safe webpage. We offer technical advice and guidance, both through our public website and, where appropriate, through direct consultation. We protect Canadian interests through advice, assistance, and collaboration with partners across the country by sending out public cyber event notices and reports. And we offer a threat notification and information sharing service. And we look for existing networks and communities so that our contributions can scale as broadly as possible. And where I work is in the developing and enriching the knowledge and personnel and skills needed to continually improve cybersecurity for Canadians. So we engage with the research and development community. We hold collaborative events like Geek Week and Hacker Gal, and we contribute to standards development as well as curriculum development with colleges and universities across Canada. Oh my goodness, every time. Okay, so what is it like to work at CSE? Well, we're a bunch of hackers, builders, creators, developers, researchers, and scientists. We live cybersecurity every day, and we offer a perspective and insight that isn't available anywhere else, right? Our main goal is to make Canada a safer place to be online, and we offer competitive wages and great benefits. And most importantly, we hire students from all over Canada. And that is my presentation. So if you have any questions, um, now I will take them. And, uh, well, and uh, so let me know what your questions are. I'm going to start off with one that just uh, got posted okay. in the chat. Um, so Brandon asks, uh, hey, do you work with the Canadian security establishment? He asked that before okay. the second slide or the second last slide. Uh, what's the difference between the CCCS okay. and the CSE? And right before that, someone asked, hey, what's the difference between the CCCS and the okay. CCTX? Oh, I can answer the CSE. <laughs> I'm not sure what CCTX stands for. I'm really horrible with I acronyms, can explain that. just so you know, and names. Um, but uh, so the Cyber Center is actually a, a part of CSE. So we're kind of a department underneath this communication security establishment. Now, when the Cyber Center was made, what we did is we took um, our information technology um, service and security group, and we combined them with the IT group from public, uh, some from public safety and some from Shared Services Canada, and we made the Cyber Center. And then we separated our, uh, our CSE, our signals intelligence work, from our cyber um, uh, security work. And that's the difference. They're the same place. I work at CSE, which I work at the Cyber Center, which is a part of the CSE. Um, that's, that's a great answer. Uh, for those of you who asked about the CCTX, that's the Canadian Cyber Threat Exchange. At the same time as all these other shifts were occurring, um, there were some organizations that were sort of created that are uh, non-profit um, organizations. Canadian Cyber Threat Exchange is there to represent um, uh, uh, Canadian businesses and allow them to exchange threat intelligence data amongst themselves. It's also another uh, very similar organization called Can Cyber, yeah. um, which is slightly different. All of them came out of this uh, very big shift that occurred in Canada's cyber uh, landscape. Um, uh, Jeremy, uh, why don't I let you kick off the question asking uh, as the president of the sure. InfoSec Club? Sure. The UFC, not the U of A. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, first, thank you for the presentation. Um, and I think I can represent quite a few students. We've we've been doing a lot of we've been trying to in our club at least do a lot of outreach, um, talking to people in the industry because of course we're on a campus which feels very isolated from the real world uh, at times, uh, very <laughs> academic focused. Um, and the survey that Mike and Morrow had put out has answers from both university students and students from SAIT, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. Um, and it's interesting to see some of their answers 
differ in places. Um, some of the answers I can see from the UFC are very academic focused. When asked mm -hmm. what is cybersecurity, uh, I saw a lot of people say confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which mm -hmm. as a TA for non repudiation. <laughs> yeah, which is a TA for information security. It, it yeah. makes me happy to see that they're learning these things. Um, but yeah, there's there's a real focus on pen testing. Um, and then another group that was talking about managing risk. Uh, it makes me think that a lot of us are very focused on the technical side of things, but yeah. we hear a lot about all of the, there's that there, it's, it's much more than that, much more than those technical things. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some of the sort of other jobs, the things that are surrounding that or or the jobs that you can take that technical background uh, and merge it with other skills that you might have? We hear a lot about report writing is extremely important. Uh, it's not something that we are taught. <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely. No, and you know, um, being able to communicate the technical information and why it is very important um, is 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 a, is a skill that our students need um, a little bit more training in. Uh, one of the things that I teach my students, because I teach uh, communications, um, I teach them about writing general awareness pieces and being and talking to an intelligent, educated audience who is not educated in the same field as you. Right. So, for instance, that skill is really important because as our IT people are working and they're saying, oh, we need brand new servers, we need all this new equipment because it's the latest and whatever. Now, how does an executive know it, how important it is to spend $100,000 on a brand new piece of equipment? How are you going to get that money for your project? And so it's important to be able to take a step back from all the jargon and all the technical terms and be able to explain it in a language that anybody can understand if given that they're an educated person, right? So that is a very important skill. Did I answer your question? Because I, I, I think so, it. yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> something that we, we just constantly hear about though is a lot of these, uh, like the soft skills that aren't really getting taught where we're, we're mm -hmm. being tested on these technical things, uh, but there are a lot of soft skills out there that are very important. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people are. are panicked about the report writing. So they they yeah. just worry that they've, they've, they've studied and they've done everything they can with a computer, but they can't write the report and that's going to trip them up. Um, yeah, and presentation and report writing are the two that we hear about a lot. And there's a lot of um, available resources out there as well um, for to be able to learn how to write better. Purdue OWL has a lot of good resources for students and um, I can find more if they want. I can send them some good activities to learn how to write for a general audience. Um, the importance of cybersecurity to the people, to the decision makers who determine which projects get funded. And oh, I see the question on the bottom for the policy side of things. There are many are there many opportunities for policy students in the government of Canada? Absolutely, we hire policy analysts all the time in every department. So in the Treasury Board Department, in uh, you know Health Canada, in the Cyber Center, in CSIS, RCMP, you name it. Absolutely, policy very important. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting that in the little survey we um, sent out, the majority of the respondents were in math, stats, computing science, data science, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we had uh, respondents from political science, uh, yeah. law, economics, yeah. and um, my own personal experience is these are some of the biggest challenges we have to face today mm -hmm. is establishing really good governance and policy whether that's coming from, say, uh, different levels of government or within organizations. It's the biggest part, the, the, the toughest challenge. Um, you, can't, you can't implement good technology to solve problems if you don't have a good guidance as to exactly. what and organization's supposed you, to do. And you, if you can put in all the technical solutions that you want to keep our information safe, but if we don't train the user and we don't educate everybody in an organization, all those technical solutions are for naught. 
because mm -hmm. our weakest link is a pe the person. So we need good writers. We need good people or people that can explain things well to at all the other um, employees in their organization. We need trainers, people that um, can put together a course and train people on cybersecurity from different viewpoints. Like what would a person who is a finance executive, what would they need to know? Well, they need to know how cybersecurity can affect the bottom line of their business, how it can affect their business reputation and what the total risk is. No, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Angela. In fact, uh, it's going to be actually a piece of our talk that we're giving tomorrow at our piece. <laughs> night. We actually uh, talked about this and yeah, it's absolutely crucial. If you are not a good communicator, uh, guess what? You know who's paying for your job? Who's paying for, you know, who's making the money? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, it's not cybersecurity. Cybersecurity right now is a cost. Uh, is. Certainly we will we will defend the assets and we will prevent assets from going, you know, uh, in, into the ether, so to speak. But mm -hmm. if you can't communicate or explain a threat or a risk or why, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, then yeah, good luck, right? So I, I tend to wholeheartedly agree. Uh, communication's pretty, Pretty crucial. So. Um, so Alex has got this question here about um, the expectation for uh, uh, degrees, master's degree or undergrad, and I, I think I think Jen, you've got a comment on this. Yeah, can you? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay. Can I? Can I want to do, uh, excellent presentation, Angela. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to add on to something that Angela had said that uh, we hire a lot of students in the policy field, which is absolutely correct. And we also have a really good rate of bridging a lot of those students into professional positions um, upon graduation. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and depending on the level of the position, we may be looking for undergrad or masters. So it's a little bit of a combination. Yeah, I think that's a really hopeful message. Um, you know, in, in Moro and I, when we deal with a lot of students, one of the questions, um, or, or even myself re recruiting people is, um, is there any chance of me getting a job in cybersecurity uh, when I'm a student, after I'm a student, uh, when I have less than five years of experience? Uh, my, my own question earlier this year was, when I have 25 years of experience, can I even find a job then? Um, <laughs> I, I, there, there's... Um, it's a really hopeful message when uh, when Jen says, "Yeah, um, undergrads have a role in in these policy jobs as well as graduates." Yeah, and the great thing about working for the government is that they have um, they they support you in your further education as long as the education is supporting your job and your role. Um, they they will support you to get further education. <laughs> Alex just sent a message off screen that you can't see. No. <laughs> it's I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up there. Um, she says, "Please don't make me do more school. I'm so tired." <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I said that to when I graduated from Algonquin, and you know I got a job at the CSC with a diploma. So yeah, you can get it with an undergrad for sure. Um, and it was CSC that helped put me through to get my bachelor's degree in science um, and now are helping me to do my master's in technology management. And uh, so you don't always have to do everything all at once, right? L cybersecurity, you're gonna have to keep learning all your life. So if you do your master's right now, you're still gonna keep learning later on. So be prepared for that and don't rush like, you know, you got a long time. I mean, I'm 45. I'm still going to school, right? <laughs> I think that um, that message also helps to address um, what Jeremy was talking about, where in cybersecurity, there is a lot of writing. Yes. Uh, if, if you're a pen tester, you've got to you've got to write um, at, at the minimum pen test narratives. Uh, if you're a risk manager, you write risk analysis. Um, Ellen made a point about um, writing briefing notes. Um, you know, the answer to this isn't that when you graduate, you have to be able to write good reports. It's going to come with a lot of practice. And experience, um, yeah. Yeah. And training. Um, I found that my master's degree made me a, fun, a, 
I'm not a phenomenal writer, phenomenally better than I was before <laughs> yeah. because you have to do so much reading and writing. Um, one of the pieces of advice I have, if you want to write better reports, read them. And there's so much out there in cybersecurity to read. Uh, don't be shy of reading those. Sometimes you have to, you'd rather watch a YouTube video on cybersecurity, but... Yeah, yeah. if you want to learn how to write, you've got to read. I mean, even if you just go to the Cyber Center website and look at our publications, there's like, a, I don't know, several hundred there that you can read. And there's information about writing threat reports because I saw that was in a question. So you got to go to our website and you got to do your research. <laughs> um, something I'm, I'm going to ask about that I think relates to this is uh, a lot of the advice Sorry, a lot of the, not a lot of the advice. A lot of what we're hearing when we're talking to professionals um, who are working in industry is that the things that they started in, and I'm not sure if this is because cybersecurity is still a relatively young profession, but a lot of these people did not start strictly speaking in cybersecurity. Yeah. They they worked in other areas um, of mm -hmm. programming or IT or system system, uh, system administrators, and then once they'd figured that out, were brought in or moved over. Um, and I, I suppose one of the things I'm wondering is, do you think that's, is that going to continue to be the norm? Or is with the demand for the number of people, is it going to be more common that students are going to be recruited directly into to cybersecurity jobs? Honestly? The crystal I ball. I want you to look in the crystal ball. Yeah, right I am looking in the crystal ball right now. It's right there. It's sinking. It's a little squirrel or whatever is in there going around on the wheel. Um, <laughs> what I think is that uh, employers are going to start taking them out of high school eventually. Yeah. So I, I, there's going to be new ways of getting jobs and there's going to be um, new the value, more value placed on experience. Mm -hmm. which sucks, but also a more value placed on certifications, which is good. And uh, there's also going to be more value based on um, your innate skills, your critical thinking skills, your ability to problem solve and work on a team. Um, in New Brunswick, they already have a program to take them right out of high school. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, actually, I was going to ask about that, you know, if there was maybe a certain type of candidate, maybe they don't have all the technical skills, you know, what, what you kind of look for. And uh, I think you just brought it up. How well do they fit on a team? Right. Those are like skills that you don't learn in post-secondary or even in secondary in a high school or anything like that. So I was just kind of curious how much that's actually weighted in what when you guys are looking for candidates. Oh, well, there's nobody that works alone at CSC. Right. We everybody works on a team. There's so much work to do. There's so many things to analyze. There's so many reports to write. And the reports could be like 130 pages. My team, we just did a 130 page report that I'm summarizing that three people wrote and I'm and I'm doing the summary of it. So yeah, you have to be able to work on a team. And I know my students, they hate it when I give them teamwork. Why do I have to work on a team? Why do I have to do this with myself? I'm like, because this is life. This is what life is. If you can't work on a team, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So just curious then, uh, you know, this is something I'm going to throw out there uh, just because I know it's uh, a criteria if I were ever to hire anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess coachability, right? Are you looking for someone that can be moldable or are you looking for someone that has all the skills, slightly moldable, but... Eh. Right. I guess that's the big question. When I hire someone, this so this is me personally, when I invite want someone on my team, um, I'll look at their base knowledge, like so their experience, just to see kind of what they've done. But to me, I find the most important thing is the attitude, the willingness to learn, the willingness to be challenged, and just like the, okay, I'm in. What do I got to do attitude? Because you can teach cybersecurity. You can teach somebody to write but you can't teach someone to have a good attitude and someone to be excited about their job. Great answer. Great <laughs> that answer. That's a good one. Innovation. Yeah. We look for people who do, they think about problems from a different perspective. And that's one of the things that we are looking for in cybersecurity is a more diverse workforce, right? Um, we need people that think literally just differently. Um, that look at problems from a different perspective. And you only get that from diversity. Um, this is interesting. Um, 
<laughs> just literally just now, yeah. Um, my LinkedIn feed came up with this, which is from Asus Toronto saying, you know what, uh, we need uh, non-traditional backgrounds to yeah. help fill the uh, cybersecurity talent gap. Um, and I couldn't agree more with that. Um, my own team is recruiting, what did my boss just post in our Discord? Uh, seven positions. And he had come to me on some of them and said, uh, oh, I don't want a cybersecurity person for that. Yeah. Um, think communications, think marketing. And this is for our core cybersecurity team. And uh, this diversity is what really makes teams strong. Uh, my own team, which is highly effective, we have people in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s all working on the same team. Um, the if if all we ever do is get the exact same people who look and think the same yeah we we, we cannot solve the cybersecurity uh, problem yeah exactly and um you know diversity and inclusion is one of the three pillars of uh, our outreach strategy and and one of the things that we are very uh, uh passionate about at csc Okay, uh, since uh, everyone's gone silent, I'm gonna ask a question. So okay. I, ap I apologize for some ignorance. Maybe I missed it in your presentation, but I'm kind of curious. So let's say, you know, a student out there in our audience was looking to, uh, you know, apply for a job with the government, like uh, in terms of, uh, you know, cybersecurity or whatever have you, uh, mm -hmm. is, how would they go about applying? Do, like, do you guys do um, uh, like recruitment drives or anything of that nature or internships? Uh, is that something that, you know, we can offer to our audience or if someone is interested, can they just approach you or I know you posted uh, LinkedIn and I know that one of our audience me members uh, kind of uh, tongue in cheek said, well, what if I don't trust LinkedIn? But uh, I, I know he was joking. <laughs> but, uh, and, and I always hammered a home, you know, honestly, there's no replacement for good networking, whether it's LinkedIn or in person, network, 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 meet people, put yourself out there. That's the only way you're going to get noticed. So I guess what I'm curious is like, how how do I attract the attention of of the government, or you know, how do I go about saying, hey, government, I'm here, I'm ready to learn, I think I'm a great person, I think I'll fit in your team, give me a shot. How how, how would I do that? I'm going to let Jen answer that one because okay. she is the uh, the human yeah, resources perfect. recruitment specialist. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so um, at CSU we have a very healthy student program. Um, I don't know, last year or two years ago, we hired over 400 students in the year. Oh. Um, I would say 55 to 60% of those were technical and a big portion of those were within cybersecurity, developers, that type of thing. Um, obviously with COVID, it's changed a little bit, but we are still recruiting for students, absolutely. Um, the thing with uh, CSC is that our process is a little bit longer than other organizations because we do have a lengthier security clearance process. So we've already finished um, recruiting for next summer, but the fall posters should be going up in February. Okay, cool. As, and as well, um, you can go to jobs.gc.ca and uh, all the government jobs are listed on there. Um, and you have to be very careful in how you apply. You have to make sure that all the experience requirements you have fully explained in like pointedly explained how you meet the experience requirements. So by that, what I'm saying to you is you cannot just submit your resume. You have to also submit a written narrative that answers every single one of the experience requirements that are listed on any of the job posters. Wow. Does someone actually read all those? <laughs> you have to, or you won't get screened wow. in. Right? That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, so, can, you, you can work for the government. Come on. They have limitless money to spend on all sorts of cool tools. That <laughs> itself ought to be like, hey, I want to apply. <laughs> yeah, you have to go in and take a look at the jobs and look at what is in the poster sure. and answer it specifically. Yeah. And, okay, and, so and Angela and Jen, the, the jobs.gc.ca board, that mm -hmm. would be 
for those like policy type jobs for other departments any jobs. as well? Uh, any? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, within any. the government or? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's a lot of different filters that you can use to uh, narrow your, like narrow the search. Okay, yeah. and so all departments post through through that one board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna check right now that it's that I just told you the right link. <laughs> <laughs> just let me type that one in, and I did. Yay! So if you go to jobs.gc.ca. Um, it, there's an even a part in there that'll teach you how to apply for a job and about the process as well. That is one of the, uh, I think, one of the biggest challenges, whether um, someone's a student, a new prof professional, or someone transitioning into cybersecurity is every single place you apply seems to have different uh, processes and expectations and different ways of measuring what makes one in cybersecurity or not. So any place that can post and say, this is how our process works, that mm -hmm. is king to me. Um, <laughs> so we have a three-part question from EB here, and I'm going to uh, start mm -hmm. off. Okay, so oftentimes it seems like the cybersecurity industry runs on the bootstrapping model of education. Teach yourself the skills you need outside of school or work. Um, and that can be a really daunting process. And so the question is, how do you recommend that we as students and young professionals find mentorship and support as we try to learn? Learn. Um, well, you know, some people might like not like this answer, um, <laughs> but get yourself a LinkedIn profile and uh, join the the one join the group that I've created because I any job I see I post it in that group. Um, but there are other groups in there for students. Um, there are other cybersecurity groups, cybersecurity professional groups, and they'll get you'll get links to a whole bunch of learning material. And also just by going in and um, searching for contacts and networking with people that are in cybersecurity, they post about the profession, they post about new technologies, they post about new ways of learning, they post everything on there. So my suggestion to you is that you have to network, you have to think about what is your skills? What What is it about you that you can give to an employer? And you need to write up a good bio in your about section. You need to spend some time to list the skills that you have and make your profile look really good. The thing is that recruiters, they pay a premium price to have a LinkedIn profile and to have access to um, be able to search for people. I get job um, emailed to me for technical writing, um, but I get them uh, at least once a month, I'll get an email from a recruiter. Hey, Angela, can you take this contract? No, I'm too busy. <laughs> but <laughs> like literally it is an invaluable tool, especially when you're out there. And I would like to tell the students as well, work on your elevator pitch. So if you meet somebody that is a, that works in a business, um, that is somewhat related to cybersecurity. So this person is somewhat of a cybersecurity professional. You need to have your elevator pitch ready about what kind of job you're looking for, what kind of things challenge you, what interests you. And you need to have that 30 second summary just like memorized in your back pocket, ready to pull out at any moment. I like that. That's very uh, that's very startup like. So uh, I, I know earlier in my life uh, I, I prescribed to that. Uh, I think somewhere along the line, uh, my thirty seconds turned into like five minutes because uh, you know, sometimes your passion just overrides any sense of uh, you know brevity. So, uh, but I agree. Uh, thirty seconds. You should be able to explain what you want, what you what who you are, what you have to offer in that thirty second. Um, yes. uh, thirty second spiel. So. Absolutely. Uh, but it's hard when you have to sit down and think about what are your skills? What are your accomplishments? What are the great things about you that you would want to say to an employer? Those are the things that you're going to put in your LinkedIn profile. Absolutely. And it, yeah, and brevity is pretty important because you want to focus on what's really important, what's going to attract them versus, you know, oh, I can ramble on about, you know, how I used to be an MCSE back in 2000. Like, uh, who cares right now? <laughs> that was 2000, right? So. Exactly. And you know what, when you, if you do get a, into the LinkedIn connect with me and then what happens was they'll, they'll LinkedIn will start to suggest other connections that are in your field. And I have met so many wonderful people that way. And I'm part of some amazing uh, 
networking groups there. Um, there's women in cybersecurity, minorities in cybersecurity group, blacks in cybersecurity group, neurodiverse cybersecurity group. So you name it, it's it's there and it's for you to connect, for you to find, and you can set up job search links. So you can put in the criteria of the job searches and then they sent automatically LinkedIn sends you the emails. This 10 jobs came up this week that fit your criteria. Absolutely, leverage yeah. what you can, right? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I have I have one question, Angela. You you mentioned that you did a diploma at Algonquin and then were hired by this was the CSE. Was that directly from Algonquin? Um, no. So uh, I when I went to Algonquin um, after that, I graduated in the high tech boom. So uh, I got into Nor Nortel and Newbridge. <laughs> you know what happened to that? <laughs> that was not the yes, best, <laughs> most fun graduating experience, right? You graduate in 98 and in 2000, everything goes downhill. Um, but, you know, I, I started out working as a repair technician in the repair center at Newbridge. And then I worked my way and then I got a job as a technical writer because I'm just, I'm naturally a, a good writer. Um, my dad is a writer, so it's just in our blood. And, uh, then I moved on to Nortel and I worked as a technical writer and a lab um, assistant. So I set up all the lab experiments and then I wrote about them and I wrote the processes. And then um, I got laid off because Nortel, you know what happened to Nortel. And yes. then <laughs> I went into sales and I started selling um, com uh, computer equipment and ICs, so integrated circuits. and. After that, I became a worked as a component engineer, working for Curtis Wright Controls, and I worked uh, picking out parts for ruggedized computers. And then I got into CSE uh -huh. as a, uh, a communication security technologist, and I worked in a lab there. And then I moved on, and yeah, it just develops. Your career develops as you go along, right? Mm -hmm. You just gotta take the opportunities as they come and make the most of them. It, is this where you would have seen yourself going eventually? Like, is this something you had had in mind at any point when you were doing that no. diploma? And, and Nope. No. Okay. No, no, I, I did not. <laughs> All I wanted was a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people out there. And that's not a bad attitude at all, right? Like you got bills to pay, you've got you've got a life to live, right? You do want a job. And if you're lucky enough to find one that you really like right away, then good for you. But sometimes it takes three, four, five jobs before you find the one that go, you go, oh my goodness, I love my job. I want to get out of bed every morning and do my work. So think about where that job is going to be. Like, what is that job that's going to give you that I want to go to work today and I love it. And maybe you can't get there today. Maybe you need some experience, but search that job, look at the experience that the job postings are asking for, and then try to find an entry level job that'll give you some of those and then move on to the next job that'll give you another portion of experience and then move to the one that you really love. Yeah. All right, this is going to be a cheap, a cheap pitch for my, uh, the type of job I do. So you met, you mentioned sales, and yeah. I get kind of curious how much that helped you uh, become a better communicator. Oh, that that, that was oh, that was good. that was hard because all of a sudden I went from being like a lab person that you mm -hmm. know ran experiments and did soldering and put things together and mm -hmm. writing to being outward facing and having to make presentations and understanding of the structure of a business and searching. That was a hard transition for sure. me, but it did but I'm, I'm, great communication. I'm gonna guess though, it opened a lot of doors for you, right? Because yeah. I, I found that in my career too. Uh, yeah. I can present, I, I can present in public. Uh, that's something I'm not afraid of. Uh, funny story, it's, you know, analogy about me, I can do karaoke when I'm not drunk. So I'm not afraid of uh, most public <laughs> things like that. But I've also found that, you know what, uh, amongst uh, the people that, you know, I was, uh, I guess, growing up with in, in, in IT as, you know, in the IT, IT industry as a career, mm -hmm. I found, you know, I was probably one of maybe 30 people I could actually sit there, uh, try and articulate something, communicate something to somebody in a public format. And I found that, you know, the more and more jobs I applied for, people were like, well, one, do you know anything about management or leadership? And I'm like, 
yeah, it's not my favorite forte, but it's like, two, can you can you speak and can you present? And I'm like, oh yeah, I got no problems with that. It's like, okay, we want to take a chance on you, right? So uh, that's just reiterating on, you know, being able to communicate and I'm going to hammer I, that. I think there's a communication. I think we have a lot of, um, a lot of the technical students, uh, I think would be frightened by that um, <laughs> because they can't, they cannot imagine a future where they would be a communicator. Um, it might shock many people to know that when I was 24 and began my career, um, I was racked with social anxiety. The very thought that today I would be doing this or uh, leading a team or giving presentations um, w w it was impossible. In fact, I was thinking, give me any career where I can just <laughs> sit at a desk in a computer and write some code. And I know that we've got students in this audience who've said that same thing to me. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example, though, that you know, um, being able to uh, uh, present yourself and speak is a skill you learn and you have to practice it. And you don't have to commit to a lifetime where you're going to be in front of people all the time, but you can practice that skill and it's going to do well for you. Um, today, um, one of our audience members, Nathan, gave a talk at B-Sides Calgary. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that when he graduated from SAIT two years ago, if someone had said, oh, yeah, you are going to be teaching classes and you are going to be presenting at conferences, he would have just went, uh, give me any other career. Uh, yet he is, uh, by all reports, uh, an absolute natural at it. It still kills him inside, doesn't it? Nathan, you can tell us. It kills you inside. <laughs> we, you, you, know, do this. you did a but, great job today presenting. So I, I will echo Michael and say, you know, Nathan just needs to have a, a bit more, uh, I guess, uh, self-esteem in terms of how well he did, right? Because, uh, yeah, I, I agree with Michael. Sometimes uh, I think he feels a little bit down on himself. And the reality oh, is he, right. he's really I, I use him as an example, though, to yeah. prove that it is a skill that you practice. And you know what? So here's another thing that I teach my students. I tell them to go into um, and look up Canada's essential skills and look at them. Their reading and writing and communicating are like the top skills. But what you don't know is that there is no other contributing factor to or that can, there's no other thing that contributed, contributes more to your rate of pay or what you can possibly make than your, um, your ability in your essential skills, which is reading, writing, and communicating math and digital technology. So um, knowing those things, that's what um, it will remove the glass windows or doors or ceilings or whatever um, and, and, uh, and allow you to to get more opportunities, right? When I first started teaching, oh my God, I was scared. It scared the, the junk, the whatever out of me. And, um, but you know, I got used to it after about, I don't know, 15 hours of teaching, I wasn't <laughs> nervous anymore, but it takes time. It really does, sure. right? Yeah. But again, it's, it's, it's practice, right? The more you practice, the more you get used to it and then it becomes a routine and it's not a problem, right? So. There's there's one piece of advice I can offer. If, if you're one of those students that you're thinking this is impossible or you're thinking, I don't even know what I would put in a good LinkedIn profile. How can I leverage that kind of social networking? You can start with one very simple thing, which is asking questions. So you open your LinkedIn profile and maybe it's not going to be the best one the first time you go around. Um, but you can start to follow other people, even people you're not connected to. And when you see something interesting posted, ask a question. Um, there's no better way to get noticed. There's no better way to impress a potential employer or someone in the industry who might be able to help you later than to ask about something they posted. The only reason they posted it is they thought it was interesting. So if you find it interesting, you've connected with them. Exactly. And don't, don't be afraid to make cold connections. Like just go on and search for somebody from the government of Canada who works in cybersecurity and press that connect button. Worst thing that they're going to, that's going to happen is they're going to press the ignore button. Yeah, that's the worst case. And that's probably if you have social anxiety, what you were hoping for in the first place. So you win either way. <laughs> that would feel terrible though. <laughs> I don't know. People have probably done it to me, but I have no idea if they've done it or not. I don't care. <laughs> uh, for sure, for sure.
So, Michael, uh, I, I don't know. I think we're coming up here on our time limit. Uh, we don't really have a time limit, but we like to try to stay within 90 minutes. But uh, before that, I'm going to ask Jeremy if he has any more questions or comments he'd like to make. Um, it might be cliche, but uh, if you remember back to all those years ago, maybe when you when you finished that diploma and we're looking around, is there anything you wish someone would have told you that hmm. you know now? I honestly wish somebody would have pointed me to um, a document like like I've talked to you guys about the workforce development and curriculum guide and said, take a look at the jobs that are in there, take a look at the responsibilities and what you're actually going to be doing when you sit down at your desk. Because sometimes the idea of the job and what you think that it is about, it does not match with reality. So that um, the workforce development and curriculum guide, the students may say like, well, the title doesn't really, you know, resonate with me, um, but it'll really give you a good view. So the, the first few chapters, which is like 15 pages or something, will give you a really good view of the entire ecosystem and how the jobs are broken down into different categories. And then when you look in the categories, you can pick out, well, what, what does a cyber operator do? You're like, oh, oh, this is what they do. What does an IT analyst do? What does a supply chain analyst do? What does an architecture person do? And take a look at those jobs because then it gives you an idea of what you're searching for, where you want to go. Because if you don't know where you're going to go, you're going to end up somewhere else. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. yeah. To, to the ship with no destination, every wind yeah. is favorable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Michael, you want to uh, start wrapping up, or uh, I, you know what? what? I think I'm going to ask one thing of uh, every audience member. Well, sorry, of uh, Jen, Jen and uh, Angela, and that yeah. is, if you could give one piece of advice to our students, it could be technical, it could be non-technical, uh, in their I guess path towards cybersecurity. What would that be? And I'm going to ask Jen first. So, yes. Jen. Oh, boy! Wow. Okay. Um, so I would say that in the interview process um, for, for a student opportunity, you need to be, you need to be uh, ready to answer technical questions, but you also need to be able to answer some of the behavioral or personal suitability type of questions as well. So uh, it's, it's not just technical, you need to be able to fill both aspects of a job. Okay. That makes any sense. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Can't, you know, you, you, you got to be more than just a robot that's brilliant, right? So that, that totally makes sense. Uh, Angela. I would tell the, my, my students, I would tell them not to be discouraged. I kept my very first, um, what is it, like a letter that I got from a company where it said, I'm sorry, but you don't meet the qualifications and you didn't get the job. What are those letters called? Letters um, of regret? <laughs> yeah, I kept mine. My very first one, I have it, okay? So, and also, I don't know if you guys are on Reddit, but if you follow the category, data is beautiful, oftentimes you will see someone will break down. I applied to a hundred jobs and I got, 50 interviews or whatever, and it worked out and I had one job at the end, right? So it'll show you the whole profile, how many jobs they applied to, how many they got interviews, how many they got calls, how many they got whatever. And you'd be surprised at how many applications it takes to get the one job. And it may have nothing to do with you. It could be that the job was already filled, but the application was still up. It, so you don't know why you didn't get the job. It doesn't matter. Don't be discouraged. Just keep going. Great advice. Great advice. Yeah. Okay. With that, Michael, I'll uh, hand it to you for wrap up. All right. Um, so in relation to the, the, the comments that uh, Jen and Angela just um, made, uh, there are courses available to you for free from Calgary Public Library or your local public library through lynda.com. That will teach you those interview skills, those soft interview skills that Jen did. There's even a great series lynda.com has with five minute simulated interviews that are so realistic, it made me cringe. Um, <laughs> and like, if anything is gonna make you feel confident, do that training and watch that video series. Uh, secondly, 
uh, we've actually covered on Moro and Mike um, a lot of these things. So go back and watch our previous videos. Um, there's quite a few of the answers about how to do those, that, that interviewing and the resources you can get to learn it. Um, and with that said, I'm going to take everyone off the screen and give my fa fa final piece of wisdom. Angela, Jen, uh, Jeremy, don't go away. We'll just have you backstage after the live stream ends. I want to give you one last piece of advice. It's the same piece of advice we give in most of our career stream and interviewing videos, and that is every job application is practice for the next one. Every interview is practice for the next one because eventually practice will make perfect and you will land that job. It's a given. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again.